Starship Flight 10 just smashed milestones for SpaceX. The liftoff and ascent were flawless. Stage separation nailed perfectly. Booster 16 pulled off a stunning ocean splashdown, dodging the downcomer failure that tanked Flight 9. The upper stage rocketed into space with all engines firing on cue, while the mission debuted the first ever payload deployment, hinting at Starship's orbital transport potential. A Raptor engine even reignited in space, proving its restart magic for future re-entry burns. Then came the thrill. Ship 37 dove steep into a brutal re-entry, facing insane aerodynamic pressure and scorching plasma. The heat shield tiles toughed it out, and despite battered flaps and the engine bay explosion that damaged the aft skirt, it flipped and splashed down in the Indian Ocean, landing just meters from the bullseye. Watch my previous video for a full, adrenaline-pumping breakdown of these epic events, linked below. Today's focus shifts to two puzzling aspects that sparked widespread speculation among spaceflight enthusiasts, a mid-flight explosion in the engine bay, and the unusual color patterns on the heat shield tiles. Thanks to high-quality footage and fresh insights from SpaceX, we can now unravel these mysteries. The engine bay explosion, occurring around 47 minutes into the coast phase, when no engines were firing, initially seemed perplexing with no obvious ignition source. Early theories suggested residual propellant ignition or structural fatigue, but detailed footage analysis points to a propellant leak from the engine chill vents as the likely culprit. Engine chill is a standard pre-ignition procedure where cryogenic methane and liquid oxygen are flowed through its turbopumps, injectors, and plumbing to cool the hardware to operational temperature. Without this conditioning, dumping cryogenic propellants into warm components risks cracks, leaks, or unstable ignition. Any excess propellant is expelled through vent lines mounted around the aft skirt, safely dumping methane and oxygen overboard. If these vent lines became clogged or partially obstructed, possibly by ice or debris, pressure could build up, rupturing the plumbing and releasing propellants into the engine bay instead of outside. Once propellants mixed near hot components in the engine bay, ignition was almost inevitable. Onboard cameras captured venting from the chill lines seconds before the event, supporting this theory. The reason for venting mid-coast remains unclear, but could relate to early conditioning for the landing burn to maintain optimal engine temperatures. The landing footage, released two days after the launch, unveils structural tearing around one of the chill vent regions, strongly indicating that this area was the blast's origin. While SpaceX hasn't officially confirmed the cause, engineering analysis suggests a vent anomaly, either from clogging or rupture, as the primary trigger. Beyond clogging, debris ingress offers another pathway. During coast, vibrations from attitude control thrusters, mechanical stresses during payload bay door operations, or general structural flexing could have dislodged tiles, or even small fragments of stainless steel. If any debris fell into the aft skirt, it could puncture the exposed chill vent lines, causing a leak. Compounding this, the in-space engine relight demo, lasting just five seconds, appears to have initiated damage on the untiled undersides of the aft flaps. That heating produced small tears in the flap skin, which may have propagated under vibration and plasma stress. If flap debris broke free, those fragments could easily have damaged vent plumbing inside the skirt, triggering the energetic flare-up we saw. The second mystery, the striking tile coloration, also finds an explanation. Some areas glowed with a vivid reddish-orange hue, while others appeared stark white, puzzling viewers. Elon Musk clarified that the red regions resulted from experimental metallic tiles installed in small clusters near the payload bay's upper section, which oxidized under re-entry heating. These test tiles, likely crafted from iron-bearing alloys, nickel-based superalloys, or copper alloyed composites, serve as high-temperature alternatives to ceramic tiles, studied for reusable thermal protection. Under Flight 10's intense re-entry heat, these metals formed reddish-brown oxides such as hematite or cuprous oxide, which spalled off as brittle layers. The plasma flow, amplified by the steep angle of attack, carried these fragments downstream, coating lower ceramic tiles like spray paint. The white patches, on the other hand, were released from areas where SpaceX intentionally omitted ceramic tiles, exposing the underlying insulation material, typically a flexible ceramic fiber blanket or felt-like material. That insulation acts as a secondary thermal protection layer, designed to shield the steel structure if tiles are lost. In this case, it was exposed on purpose to gather direct flight data on how well the insulation alone handles plasma heating. Re-entry footage confirms these white areas match the omission sites across the belly. 
at the nose cone, which faced a distinct thermal profile. Due to its position and steeper trajectory, tile damage exposed more of this blanket, contributing to the widespread white coloration. Together, these tests gave SpaceX invaluable information, how metallic tiles behave under plasma conditions, and how well backup insulation performs when exposed directly. Despite the steep angle maximizing heat flux, nearly all primary ceramic tiles remained attached, validating the bonding technique and heat shield integrity, key for reusability. Flight 10 also confirmed design fixes from prior missions. Recently released post-splashdown imagery of Ship 31 from Flight 6 revealed hotspots that formed just outside the tile line, where bare stainless was exposed. To address this, engineers refined the tile interface by tapering the edge transitions and adding protective coatings or insulation to smooth out the thermal gradient. The results were clear in Flight 10. Those same regions remained intact through re-entry, confirming the effectiveness of the modification. Another experiment involved the non-structural catch fittings bolted to the ship's sides. These mounts, precursors to the eventual chopstick tower catch system, were fully exposed to re-entry plasma. Their survival provided SpaceX with critical baseline data before these fittings ever experienced the mechanical stresses of a real catch. Block 3 ships, starting with Flight 12, already incorporate updated versions of these mounts, with the first live catch attempts expected between Flights 13 and 15, depending on Block 3 performance. Just seconds before its landing burn in Starship Flight 10, the booster shook unexpectedly, possibly due to a malfunction or partial detachment of one of the four grid fins, though this remains unconfirmed. If a fin was indeed compromised, the damage might have originated from structural fatigue under re-entry stresses, or perhaps from the intense exhaust plume during hot staging striking the fin and weakening it. As the vehicle pressed deeper into the thicker atmosphere, any such damage could have escalated, amplifying the instability seen in the footage. The booster briefly tumbled, but quickly stabilized itself using the remaining three fins, demonstrating remarkable aerodynamic redundancy. This incident unintentionally validated something SpaceX engineers had predicted in simulations. Only three fins are necessary for stable descent and alignment with the launch tower. Block 3 boosters are already being designed with three fins to save mass and reduce complexity. Thanks to Flight 10, this design choice now has real-world confirmation. In the end, Flight 10 was not flawless, but that's precisely what makes it valuable. Mid-flight anomalies tested the vehicle's resilience, while deliberate stress maneuvers exposed weaknesses and validated fixes. The ship endured violent plasma heating, partial flap tearing, aft skirt damage, and still managed a controlled flip and splashdown just three meters from its target. For SpaceX, the mission provided a wealth of data, each finding feeding directly into the rapid iteration cycle that has defined Starship's progress. Shifting focus from Flight 10, the newly released onboard footage from Flight 9 offers a revealing look into the upper stage failure that derailed that mission. I'll summarize the essentials here. But for a full breakdown, you can find the dedicated analysis video linked below. To recap, the Flight 9 anomaly was traced to a cracked fuel diffuser canister within the autogenous pressurization system. This hardware is responsible for dispersing gaseous methane evenly into the main tank, maintaining stable ullage pressure during flight. The crack redirected gas into the nose cone payload bay, spiking internal pressure, freezing sensors, and triggering automatic vehicle passivation, leading to uncontrolled re-entry. The fresh footage captures the exact instant the diffuser ruptures, showing a burst of methane vapor flooding the bay just after orbital insertion. This visual evidence confirms the leak's timing and demonstrates how the rapid pressure surge overwhelmed nearby electronics, supporting SpaceX's subsequent efforts to reinforce the component with a more robust design, which worked on Flight 10. Following Flight 10's success, SpaceX teams wasted no time launching post-flight inspections at the Starbase launch site. Crews are meticulously examining the launch mount, tower, ground support systems, and adjacent pad structures for any signs of stress, thermal damage, or structural wear caused by the intense launch conditions. These ongoing repairs and upgrades are essential to ready the site for Flight 11, the last Block 2 Starship test before SpaceX shifts to the more advanced Block 3 vehicles. Flight 11 will feature Ship 38, currently inside Mega Bay 2 which has already received all its Raptor engines and is undergoing aft flap installation, preparing for static fire testing. The booster for Flight 11 has not yet been confirmed. It could be the brand new Booster 17 or the recovered Booster 15 from Flight 8. 
Following the completion of Block 2, SpaceX will transition to Block 3 ships and boosters, beginning with Ship 39 and Booster 18. Ship 39's nose cone was recently stacked onto the payload bay section inside the Star Factory, and these components will soon move to Mega Bay 2 for further stacking, marking the start of Block 3 ship integration. Booster 18 is being stacked in Mega Bay, while its redesigned next-gen grid fins are being prepared in the Star Factory. These new fins are 50% larger and significantly stronger than the current set, enhancing aerodynamic control authority during descent and reducing reliance on excessive engine gimbal corrections. The fins also incorporate integrated lift and catch structures. Unlike current generation boosters, which feature separate catch points beneath the fins, Block 3 consolidates these into the grid fins, streamlining the design. The fins are positioned lower on the booster to align with tower catch arms and reduce thermal exposure from Starship's engines during hot staging. Block 3 launches are expected to begin by the end of this year with heavy flight activity next year. Afterward, SpaceX plans to transition to Block 4 vehicles. The latest performance graphics highlight how the development roadmap has shifted. What was previously labeled as Block 3 in earlier charts has now been rebranded as Block 4 while the new Block 3 emerges as a transitional phase, a slightly stretched and upgraded version of Block 2 rather than a complete overhaul. This change stems from the incomplete success of Block 2's test campaign, which has yet to fully achieve its objectives or gather all critical performance data needed for a radical redesign. Three Block 2 flights ended in failure before completing their missions, and a fourth ship was lost in a ground test explosion. These setbacks left significant gaps in the test program, prompting SpaceX to introduce Block 3 as a lighter evolution of Block 2. This approach allows the company to methodically close those gaps and refine systems without leaping prematurely into the ambitious Block 4 architecture. Block 4, in contrast, will be the true next-generation Starship. Beyond incremental upgrades to payload capacity, propellant load, and thrust levels, it will bring major structural changes. The ship will carry 42 Raptor engines in total, achieved by adding three additional vacuum Raptors to the upper stage, and it will be significantly lengthened. The result is a towering vehicle, with the stack height stretching to around 142 meters, by far the tallest rocket ever conceived. If development stays on track, the first Block 4 flight could happen as early as 2027. Alongside vehicle upgrades, SpaceX is expanding the Starbase launch site, with details outlined in the recently released site plan. The most striking modification is the rebuild of Pad A to match Pad B's robust launch mount and flame trench system, engineered to withstand the mechanical, thermal, and acoustic stresses of Block 3 launches and beyond. The ground support infrastructure is also getting a major overhaul. SpaceX is expanding the tank farms for propellant storage, adding a new flame deflector water tank farm for Pad A, and creating additional water storage areas to support the cooling demands of the flame diverter systems at both pads. One of the most significant changes is the addition of on-site liquid methane and nitrogen production facilities. By producing cryogenic propellants directly at Starbase, SpaceX will reduce dependence on constant tanker deliveries and streamline the entire launch cadence. Altogether, these steps underscore SpaceX's commitment to refining Starship's design and infrastructure, paving the way for ambitious goals by 2027.